ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children 18 plus. You are tuned into the Loan Officer Podcast with me, Dustin Owen, and my main man, JC. John Coleman. I know you're doing such a great job, man. You're talking good library voices. Yes. Yes. John goes out and buys us uh, a new mic. What do you call these things? These little round things. I call them like. <laughs> you just call them spit catchers. Spit catchers. Yeah. I know. It's a cloud lifter a little bit, you know, back end hard, hardware equipment, you know, to amplify those. Yeah. But after like 123 episodes or 120, you, you flipped got- a script and you went out and you bought, you bought these new ones. And all of a sudden I'm listening. I'm like, dude, my audio sounds jacked up. I know. But now you can talk as a normal human. You don't have to get it right up. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I kind of like getting way up close I know, to the mic. because when you get excited and you make a good point, you really want to get up on the mic. But now, hey, man, you can just talk like this. All right, right we'll try something new. I got my cup of Joe. Uh, got my got my 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 main man back in right? the saddle. It's been a while. Yeah, we had some guests on, some pretty awesome guests though. I mean, oh. we went we went Murph. Yep. We went Bill. Yep. Then we went with Grant and Cynthia at the same time. Back to back to back to back. Yeah. I know. This is, I think it's the first time I've been here since with the new setup. Now I can see without all these obstructions. It's interesting. It is. It, yeah. Yeah. You can just peer right in the mic. I know. Like, no, I, can't, I couldn't hide behind. Yeah, you like, can't Before hide. I couldn't hide behind that <laughs> mic. No, I mean. no it's, it's, it's good to be back. And uh, today we're going to do a show. Um, this is actually a, a viewer request yep. from like a couple months ago. Right. Uh, so much that I forgot about it. And you came in this morning like, hey, uh, by the way, I'm going to remind you, we're going to do it on MSAs. Yeah. And I know that you're well-versed in MSAs, right? Uh, yeah. I, I, up, up, up about until five minutes ago, I was. Yeah. And you uh, told me. Oh, you weren't. I weren't, yeah. Now, I was not. now you're a now subject matter expert because I spent sneaky, five minutes. But not, with if five minutes with you, you can become an expert on many things. All right. Well, we're going to jump into uh, MSAs, okay. which do you know what they stand for, John? Marketing service agreements. Yeah, marketing service agreements. JVs. The pinnacle of my athletic career. <laughs> yes. Yes, for, for many, you know, playing a JV sport in high school, that was the pinnacle of their athletic career. Yep. No joint venture. Okay. And we're going to talk about desk rentals. Desk rentals. Now, we're going to talk specifically as it pertains to mortgage, real estate, and new construction. Okay. But I want people to know JV in the business world in general doesn't just pigeonhole someone into a relationship between a builder and a lender, a relationship between a real estate company and a lender. Okay. I mean, JVs are prevalent, especially um, like my friends who do commercial real estate. Mm -hmm. So my friends in commercial real estate, they're going out and they're purchasing apartment complexes, some that are only 10 units, some that are 50 units. And when they purchase them, they like to JV it. They like to do a joint venture. That's where maybe they're on the real estate side, but they need, need someone on the general contracting side of things. So they'll go into a partnership. If you remember Dennis Miller, the serial entrepreneur who was on, his favorite P word is partner, right. where he goes and finds a partnership. They, he, they create an LLC specific for that one entity. And the general contractor does his piece of work or her piece of work. Mm-hmm. The real estate person does their piece. And they sometimes can have a joint venture with three entities where maybe there's a financer mm. who does who does it. So the, the term JV is not specific to just, oh, people who are in the mortgage industry. Huh. JV just means two entities coming together, creating a new entity, right. and then going to partnership together, joint and venture. Makes sense. Makes sense, right? Um, but like, let's get into joint ventures as they pertain to the mortgage and real estate world, as well as the mortgage and new construction world. Let's talk about how a desk rental could be the better um solution right. for what's trying to transpire and also let's talk about the complexities of an msa or a marketing service agreement sounds good okay so at the end of the day what are they why are they mm-hmm. well at the end of the day it's because a home builder or a realtor has realized that they control the lead mm. and that they want someone else to partner with them financially to cover the cost of that lead acquisition. Okay. Okay. And by the way, full disclosure, this is the world according to me, the world according to DO. Yeah. So this is not scripture. I ask everybody to check with their compliance department, to check with their attorneys mm-hmm. and, and to uh, get their take because I'm not a compliance officer. I'm not an attorney. I never have been. I don't even care to play one on TV. Oh, wow. All right. All right. Uh, if you're tuning in for the first time, 
Thanks for tuning into this episode, but please know we have 120 plus other episodes that you can find on YouTube at The Loan Officer Podcast, on Spotify at The Loan Officer Podcast, on Apple Podcast mm-hmm. at The Loan, Loan Officer Podcast. And I know some people find us on Podbean, some people listen to us on Google, anywhere where you can find podcasts, you can find The Loan Officer Podcast. You can also follow us on our socials. Mm-hmm. We are on TikTok, we are on Instagram, we are on Facebook. And we're on LinkedIn yep. at the Loan Officer Podcast. And I am Dustin Owen. You can find me as an individual on LinkedIn. There you go. This show was brought to you by someone who connected with us through one of those mediums mm-hmm. and said, hey, can you do a show on MSAs? And we said, well, we'll do one better. MSAs, Joint Ventures, and Desk Rentals. Right. All right. All right. And I threw out the disclaimer mm-hmm. because you need to understand a marketing service agreement is something that comes with a lot of red tape and a lot of scrutiny. You have, we have this thing called the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. They need to make sure that consumers are always protected. Um, You have this thing called RESPA and RESPA Section 8. And the Real Estate Services Protection Act protects consumers uh, against two entities getting together. Let's say a builder Mm -hmm. and a lender or a realtor and a lender and steering said consumer one direction. Okay, it's all about giving the consumer choices. Choices, supposedly, in a uh, world of of capitalism Mm -hmm. is what's going to allow people to choose what's best for them, whether it's through service or price or both. Okay. All right, so just good to know. Mm -hmm. So what is a marketing services agreement? Mm A marketing service agreement, the way that I know it, let's say John owns a Keller Williams office Mm -hmm. and I am a mortgage lender. Mm -hmm. John comes to me, the mortgage lender, and says, hey, D.O., I want you to be my office's preferred lender. I'm like, wow, that would be amazing, John. Mm -hmm. I would love to be your preferred lender. And you're like, okay, cool. It's just going to cost you five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 a month. Okay. At which point John maybe takes a step back, a sip of his drink and goes, uh, let me think about that. Yeah. Let me think about that. Well, what am I getting for this? Because it's illegal for John, the owner of the real estate office to tie my money to a direct lead. Oh, you, you can't be like, Hey, Dio, I'm going to make sure you close five transactions a month. I'm going to make sure that you get 100 leads a month. No, I can't pay for a lead. I cannot directly pay for a lead. Now, the world, according to Dio, MSAs are are legal pay for play. Do not fool yourself. If you're a loan officer who is paying money or your company is paying money for you to be the preferred lender within a specific real estate office, you are paying for leads. That's exactly what it is. Yeah, right. (laughs) But we can't call it that. So you have to be able to pay for marketing. At which point there, and there are third party services out there and you'd have to utilize a third party service to come in and audit everything that the real estate office is giving you in exchange for your, Uh, yep. So like the real estate office can say, well, we list X amount of homes for sale and we'll make sure that every time we list a home for sale, your marketing collateral gets distributed amongst all the people who are listing their home for sale, as well as anyone that goes and looks at that home for sale. Okay. You are paying us X amount of dollars per month. We will make sure that your signage is in these locations within the physical office. Right. You're paying X amount of dollars per month. We'll make sure that your brand is represented appropriately on our website. Mm-hmm. You are spending X amount of dollars a month. We will make sure that your marketing flyers get distributed mm-hmm. amongst this many people on a monthly basis. Yeah. So there, there is a legal way to justify the money that you are giving that particular real estate office. But please know, why are you doing this? Because ultimately, no one ever wakes up saying, man, I would love to get a home loan today. Can't wait. I can't wait to go 30 years in debt. Let's go. No, people want a home. Right. And they tend to go to real estate offices or home builders in order to, to inquire about purchasing said home. At which point that realtor says, well, are you paying cash? Or are you obtaining a home loan? Mm-hmm. 80% of the people are obtaining a home loan. Therefore, would you know a good lender who is local, who will do a great job? I got a guy. Let me introduce you to my guy or girl. Yep. Right? That is ex- exactly how a MSA works. Mm. Now, that being said, someone who has worked inside of MSAs, and I've structured MSAs, I'm not opposed to an MSA. 
And I'll talk a little bit about that. But someone who's not the preferred lender, I'm going to share this with you. Never, ever, ever let that deter you from marketing your services and your brand to the agents within that brokerage. Because more times than not, the mortgage company who's paying to be the preferred lender, they're paying the owner of that brokerage. Right. That owner's agents are 1099 contractors. So they may not have a vested interest necessarily to partner with the preferred lender. Right. Now they may tow the company line, do a solid buy by their broker owner, and they may throw a bone to the mm -hmm. preferred or in-house lender from time to time. But when you're working, whether you're on the real estate side or the lending side, and you're structuring an MSA, know that you're structuring it based on a 25% capture rate. If you as the in-house lender can capture 25% of all of the buyer business, mm -hmm. you're winning. Right. Well, if I'm not the preferred, that should make me excited. That means that 75% of every home buyer who uses a realtor out of that particular office, whether I'm the preferred or someone else is the preferred, 75% of those home buyers are utilizing someone else, not the in-house lender. Right. So ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, if you're a loan officer tuning in and you're like, oh, that local EXP office or that local Caldwell Banker office or mm -hmm. Remax office, they have such and such and such lender in there as the preferred, cool. Just know that at best, that in-house lender is only capturing 25% of the business. Mm. That means you should be calling on those agents and building relationships. Right. You might not be able to freely walk into that real estate office. Yeah. You may have to, you know, backdoor it by using texting and emails and, and, and cell phone calls mm -hmm. to invite someone to meet you off site. Yeah. But it's open game. No different than if you're the one being invited to be the preferred lender. Sure, it strokes your ego a little bit, makes you feel proud, you puff your chest out, mm. but what are you gonna get? At best, a 25% capture rate? Mm. When you start running the, 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 the ROI, mm -hmm. right? Everything in life should be ROI. Whether or not I change my own oil, what's my ROI? Mm. You're like, because my time is worth a certain amount of dollars, it may be cheaper for me to pay someone else to do it, so then I can take that time saved and apply it towards something that is of higher and better use of my time, right? Correct. Same thing has to apply. If I'm going to agree to be the in-house lender and I'm going to contribute towards that MSA fee, is there an ROI? How much incremental business am I going to get? Mm -hmm. Knowing that it's a 25% capture rate. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stay on MSAs and I'm going to talk briefly about JVs and then I'm going to really talk about desk rentals. Okay. Okay. So just kind of food for thought if you're following along at home and you're waiting for me to get to JVs or get a desk rental, please know that I'm getting there. Okay. Okay, but back on on the, the MSAs. Here are my two train of thoughts on an MSA. Okay. You either go, you enter into an MSA in a defensive mode, or you do an offensive mode. Okay. Okay. You do not ever sit stagnant or or sit what, what I call um, kind of like a, a ship at sea, with the sail down and mm -hmm. the motor off where you're just floating aimlessly. Yeah. No, no, we, we, we don't do that. If you're a mortgage lender tuning in, mm -hmm. then this is again, the world according to DO, right. this is how I would approach an MSA. Is there a certain point in a LO's career where they would enter in an MSA? Is it better for like younger loan officers, more experienced loan officers? Does it really matter? Great question. Awesome question. If you are a younger loan officer, by all means, accept being placed into an MSA. I think it's a great way to get started. Okay. Even if you're gonna take reduced basis points, which by the way, you should, right? If, if your company is paying five, 10 or $15,000 a month to be the quote unquote preferred lender, they then also can't afford to pay you right. your 115, 125 basis points. Right. You're probably gonna make 75 basis points. That may be a trade-off if you now have a more captive audience mm -hmm. Uh, and and you you increase the probability of you being referred, which means you're going to see more referrals, more at bats, more at bats lead mm -hmm. to more closings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, or if you're a branch manager or you own your own brokerage, you may want to enter into an MSA because that then allows you to go out and hire and recruit loan officers, and then you can slide those loan officers into that MSA. Right. Um, so it can be on both sides. You ask if it better if you're if you're a new LO, be okay with it, mm -hmm. or if you're seasoned, 
and you're trying to grow your team, you're seasoned, you're trying to grow your branch, you're seasoned and you're going off on your own and you're starting your own company, then you could strategically. Mm -hmm. But this is when, when I said just a minute ago before you asked the question, like there's two ways that I would enter into it. Right. In, in a very uh, offensive or a defensive. So let's just go with the offensive because that's what you just asked me. Okay. Uh, without asking, without <laughs> knowing you asked me, you asked me, like, what would your approach be? Yeah. Yeah, if I'm a new loan officer, I'm going to enter into it knowing that I'm doing this for 12 to 24 months, probably about 18. Mm -hmm. And I'm strategic about it. I'm going to get in. I'm going to either accept my reduced basis points or I'm going to contribute to that marketing fee that either I or my company is paying. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to build as many relationships as I can, knowing that if I knock it out of the park, a, a success is a 25% capture rate. So if I knock it out of the park and I get a 35% capture rate, mm -hmm. cool. I'm going to attend all of their, their networking functions, all of their holiday parties, all of their team building events. I'm going to contribute to them. Like I'm going to be a part of this team. I'm the preferred lender. I'm inside of the real estate office. I'm going to build relationships with as many people as I can. Right. And then after about 18 to 24 months, I'm getting out. Deuces. Right. Right. It's kind of like that running back who just, you know, made it through the line of scrimmage. He broke the linebacker's tackle, yeah. slipped through the safety. Oh, he's gone. And gone. Deuces yeah. up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, like I'm going to do that because here's what I've learned. I got in, I built real relationships. Mm -hmm. I've gained everything that I can gain from this. Mm -hmm. Let me stop paying the money, stop taking reduced basis points. And I'll carry with me a legacy of relationships and a legacy of past clients that I'll build upon, but it's not worth my money any longer to be in that office. Right. Defensive would be, man, John, I've had a great relationship with you and your team for the past three, mm -hmm. seven, 17 years. Mm -hmm. And I do a lot of business with you and your agents. I love working with you guys. Like we are just, me and my team are, grooving with you guys mm -hmm. and i like you yeah like as zig ziglar taught like i only do business with people that i like and do business the way that i like to do it yeah. and that's you guys and i understand you're at a point that mm -hmm. whether i pay you five or ten grand a month or someone else pays you five ten grand a month you want five or ten grand a month and i have to ask myself is it worth me paying or my branch paying sixty thousand dollars a year or a hundred thousand dollars a year in order to fully wrap my arms around this relationship, embrace it, mm -hmm. throw up yeah. some 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 10 foot walls, build a moat, throw some cock, some crocodiles <laughs> yeah, in that yeah, moat, yeah. or is it not? It might not be, by the way. It, you may look at it and be like, man, I love this relationship for five, seven, 17 years we've had it. Mm -hmm. We groove well together, but when I run my ROI and you're asking me to pay you $7,000 a month or $84,000 a year, I'm gonna take my chances that enough of your agents will still continue to refer me business, not at the same magnitude that they used to, right. but they will. And all of that time I used to dedicate to you guys, being at your beck and call, answering all of your questions, I can take my talents elsewhere mm -hmm. and do the same thing and I'll still retain some of those relationships because those are real relationships I've built. Yeah. So like there's two ways of, of attacking an MSA. You can do it offensively where you're like, hey, I'm going on offense yeah. and I'm going to pay money. I'm going to dive into this. It's going to be all or nothing and I'm going to make it all. And then after 18 months, peace. peace. Mm -hmm. Or I'm going to go into one saying, hey, I love this and it's worth me spending $84,000 right. a year mm -hmm. in order to, to not lose it because right. I really don't want to go out there and rebuild it. But I encourage people to sit down and 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 run mm -hmm. uh, both scenarios and figure out like you're now going to be paying five or seven or ten thousand dollars a month for business that you already earned and won. Right. That's, yeah, that's a good good way to put it. So then your question is, if I pay this money, am I going to pick up some incremental business? Because sometimes you will. Right. When I look at a real estate office that has, let's say, sixty agents, I'm probably doing business with eight to ten, mm -hmm. and maybe four of them are top producers. And that's really where the bulk of my referrals are going. And if that broker owner wants me to come in as the preferred and and I know that by coming in, it's going to cost me money that it wasn't already costing me. Mm -hmm. What I have to ask myself is, well, am I going to pick up some one off business? Mm -hmm. Because I said they had 60 agents. I only probably worked with 10 of those 50 are those 50 going to then give me an opportunity to earn their trust 
partner with them, finance their their home buyers, mm -hmm. and at a minimum, I picked up enough incremental business from those agents I didn't already have a relationship with that it paid Amazing. for the, the the MSA fee, mm -hmm. and I was able to keep the wolves away from the 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 eight agents that I already right. did work with. Right. Right, because that's those are the that's the thought process you should go into. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, so that's that's MSAs at a very high level, surface level, as I know them. All right. I'm gonna talk about JVs now, joint ventures. Okay, JVs. What are JVs all about, Dio? All right, so a JV would be where a real estate office says, I don't want a five thousand dollar fee or a ten thousand dollar fee. I want half of the profits. Damn. Yeah, like I want half of the profits. Okay, that means your mortgage company and this real estate office. Mm -hmm are going to come together in holy matrimony. Mm -hmm. They're going to conceive a child and out is birthed a brand new entity, a brand new company, Okay, right? So John Coleman Real Estate comes together with Owen Financial mm -hmm. and we end up with JC Owen Mortgage ah. as our company. Okay, You're half owner and I'm half owner. Mm -hmm. This tends to never benefit the loan officer because the minute you start introducing a second entity, a second equity partner, mm -hmm. then that means someone's taken half the profits off the table. Right. Well, your mortgage company that you work for or run, you already have your business model put in place where you want X amount of basis points of profit. Mm -hmm. And obviously the real estate company, they too, are doing this because they see this as a better model than just having an MSA. Mm -hmm. So they too want X amount of basis points and profit, at which point they'll go to the loan officer and say, hey, look, when you work for us, we're going to give you a captive audience. Mm -hmm. And because it's a captive audience, I don't need to pay you 100 or 125 basis points. I only need to pay you 50. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, but a JV or a joint venture is when two entities come together. Mm -hmm. By the way, because it's a brand new mortgage company, there's a lot of legal and compliance that goes on. So you typically would not do a joint venture for one real estate office with 100 agents. You would do it for a real estate entity that probably had 10 or 12 offices spread out amongst oh. a geographic region. Gotcha. And each office averaged 100 to 200 agents. So now you're talking about uh, a large Logist. enough conglomerate right. that it's going to make sense financially right. because it just, it, it's a lot to own a mortgage company. It's a lot to, to, to have to cover just from a compliance standpoint yeah. where you see JVs a lot of times with builders, a home builder who oh. is building four or five communities and each community is 100 to 300 homes. So there's, four or 500 homes being closed on, CO'd and closed on on an annual basis, mm -hmm. that particular mortgage company may, or a builder may very well want to partner with a mortgage company mm -hmm. to create a joint venture. That makes sense. But I have a, 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 a friend of a friend. A friend of a friend was the preferred lender for a very large national builder. And then that large national builder wanted to JV with his mortgage company. Well, that was great for the home builder because the home builder is like, look, we're leaving money on the table. We should own our own mortgage company, but we don't want to go out and start our own mortgage company. We'd rather just partner with you, uh, yeah. mortgage company. Let's JV it. Mm -hmm. um, we'll split the profits with you. We bring the leads. Mm -hmm. You bring all of the technical know-how of running a mortgage company. Let's partner A versus B, create our own company, which is now C, mm -hmm. and that's the joint venture. Okay. Well, my buddy of a buddy was closing 40 to 50 transactions a year that that builder was referring him and had for the past seven years. Mm -hmm. By the way, 40 to 50 transactions, that's like someone's year. And this was, this was you know, what this mm -hmm. one originator was getting. But the minute the, the company, the builder wanted to JV with his mortgage company, he lost all of that business. What? Yeah, because he had a choice. You can't work for your mortgage company and work for the JV. The JV is its own entity. Oh, no way. Yes. So you have to make a choice. Do I want to work for the JV mm. or do I want to continue working for my mortgage company? Hmm. Well, in order for him to work for the JV, he would have had to go on the JV's comp plan and the JV's company, this mm -hmm. you know, company mm -hmm. C, mm -hmm. the baby of A right. and B coming together, 
that comp plan is was far inferior to what he was earning. And this guy closes like 300 loans a year. Yeah. So 60 or 50 was almost 20%, yeah, but it wasn't enough for him to be like, yeah, let me go do this. Mm -hmm. Instead, he lost it. Now, his company still now is part owner in this new entity. Mm -hmm. But if you're the company, if you're the owners of that company, you're like, look, they had to do the JV. It was either lose all of the business mm -hmm. or create a JV, at which point they at least get to ca keep half right. the business. He's just like a casualty then. He, he was a casualty. So loan officers tuning in, JVs very rarely make sense for you if you're an established loan officer. Now, you may want to go work for a JV, right? I've, I've actually given that advice to, to younger professionals. Hey, look, or even professionals who are really good technicians, but they just weren't good at marketing themselves and, and, and bringing them the business. Mm -hmm. I'm like, look, go work for a builder. Go work as the in-house lender for a home builder. You'll close 30, 40 million. You'll make your 140, $150,000 a year. Okay. Now you won't make the 300 to $400,000 a year if you are working for a company, let's say like um, Guild or Waterstone or Guaranteed Rate or Fairway and you are the person going out and, and, and bringing in the leads, but you could go work for a joint venture, mm -hmm. at which point, hmm. you know, the builder's lender is probably a joint venture. That builder doesn't own their own mortgage company. They're probably JV'd with another mortgage company. They may own it, who knows? Mm -hmm. But you're working off of a um, captured audience. Right, yeah. Therefore, they don't have to pay you 100 to 125 basis points. They can pay you 40 basis points right. because the hard part was already done for you. Yep. And the hard part is getting the lead, getting the lead. Yeah. Yeah. He, who, he or she, she who controls, controls the lead, lead controls, controls the purse. The yeah. Yeah. I mean, you control, you control the purse strings. Yeah. All right. So that's a JV. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Any questions on, on like what a joint venture is? Nah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Desk rental. Let's go. I'll give you five bucks. You let me sit in the boiler room and run numbers. If that's, that's kind of what it is. Yeah. I mean, look, <laughs> I like desk rentals because most times when you sit down, and you talk to a owner broker of a real estate office, look, they're looking for some money to help offset their cost at the end of the day. And they like the idea of having a lender that is on site as a value add to their agents. Mm. And usually that broker owner is going to look towards a lender in their local community that they already know, like, and trust. And instead of saying, hey, pay me $5,000 a month or $2,500 a month on this MSA, at which point that has to be vetted, mm -hmm. uh, that, that it has to um, adhere to all of the requirements to make sure that we're properly masking what is truly pay for play into, <laughs> oh, no, it's not pay for play <laughs> yeah. with the, hey, every month I need you to show me pictures of the signage. And every month I need you to show me what type of uh, exposure you had to the to the home buyer community and every month like yeah. that's what that's what transpires when you're in an MSA. There's a lot of um, record keeping that has to be done to right. make sure that you're being compliant. Right. Well, a desk rental, it could just be like, look, I have four thousand square feet, of which I'll rent you a ten by twelve room, and the market rent for that size room based on what I'm paying is 750 a month or 900 a month or 600 a month. Let me just rent, rent you space. Mm -hmm. And as a loan officer, I may want to do that because maybe that broker owner has a handful of agents that I really do dig and I get along with mm -hmm. and I enjoy working with them and their clients. And I want to show up every Tuesday and Thursday from 10 to four. And I want to work out of that location. Yeah. Cool, man. Desk rental is the way to go. All you have to make sure of is you're not going to fool anyone if you walk into a place and you're paying two thousand dollars a month desk rental, and the total square footage is like is like six thousand square feet, and the rent is five thousand dollars. Right. Yet you're trying to pay two grand for a ten by twelve space. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. You have to pay whatever is is consummate to the total mm -hmm. space and the allocation. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times you can overcome what you want to overcome with a desk rental. Mm. Now, please know this: I talked about MSAs as it pertains to. Uh, real estate offices, mm -hmm. you can MSA with a builder. Okay. hundred percent. You have a builder that, that loves you and loves the work that you do. A hundred percent. You want to be that builder's preferred lender and, and home builders. They love having preferred lenders because they operate assembly line. They need to know that a closing is going to happen on time. They can't start construction for someone with a haphazard pre-approval. 
Wow. Right. So, so home builders, it really does benefit them to have a preferred lender because there is so much going on during their transactions from someone signing a contract to them uh, uh, breaking open a piece of land right. and then putting in footers and laying foundation like like they need to partner yeah. with a lender. So it does behoove and, and, and not all builders are big enough to have a JV. Not all real estate offices, very few real estate offices in the United States are big enough for a JV. So you tend to see MSAs with real estate offices or desk rentals. But please know in certain markets, if you have a home builder who isn't big enough for a JV, that's fantastic, by the way. You can do an MSA. You can do a desk rental. Or what if you just work something out with the home builder that you were able to offer some kind of incentive to their clients, like no lender fees? Mm. Like if you have a home builder, all the home builder is trying to do is protect their process, make sure they're only building homes for people who are actually going to be able to close on the transaction once the home is CO'd. Mm -hmm. And they need to have a lender who understands how they operate and is there to best assist them in getting things closed smoothly. Yeah. Sometimes builders are given out incentives to use the preferred lender. Now, those incentives, you're not fooling anybody. They're already built in, into the into the total equation of what the cost of the home is going to be. Yeah. But the builder likes the incentive because they like to know who is on the other end of getting this transaction closed. Right. I promise you, from, from understanding the building community, that's what they care about. Yeah. That more so than the couple grand they're going to make uh, by having an MSA or, or some kind of a joint venture or some kind of a desk rental. Mm -hmm. they, they want the service aspect first. But... If the builder is already given an incentive to use one of their preferred lenders, instead of you just going through the rigmarole of becoming a, a preferred lender and paying a, a desk rental or an MSA fee of two thousand, five thousand, ten thousand, or twenty thousand a month, what if you just agreed to give a lender credit of a thousand dollars for every home that you financed? Oh. Because if the if the builder's already paying five, but they know that you're going to kick in one. Now you've reduced their cost by $1,000 per transaction. And why I like that, it's a variable cost, meaning you only pay it when you actually have a loan that closes. All right. So that right there is, is a way to circumvent even the requirement of an MSA or a JV or a desk rental. Maybe you can still be the preferred lender for a, for a builder. And all you have to do is offer some kind of an incentive, like a closing cost credit for when one of their buyers uses you and your firm for... All right the financing of their purchase. Right. That's MSAs, JVs, and desk rentals. I hope I did the best job of keeping it surface level, mm -hmm. of keeping it um, 30,000 feet in the air, yeah. but understanding that there's a good, there's a bad, there's an ugly. Mm -hmm. um, they're not always the best, but they're also something you shouldn't run from. It's something that... that a loan officer, a branch manager, an owner of a mortgage company, a realtor, a, a broker owner of a real estate office, a builder. Like people should be having these conversations and they should be looking for win-win situations. Right. I do coach loan officers to never, ever, ever lead into a relationship with money. It's just, it's a recipe for disaster. I can't think of many relationships where you lead into it with money and it turns out well. Right. Uh, you lead into the relationship because it's going to make sense for both parties. Mm -hmm. Both parties bring something to the table. They're like-minded. They, they, they share service values, but you can intertwine money again, if it's a win-win, mm. but just because someone called you and offered you the opportunity to be the preferred lender does not mean you have to jump at the opportunity and stroke a check. Mm. You have to understand, well, what's my conversion ratio going to be? How much potential business is, is there to be had? What is expected of me? Mm. Like, is, am I going to be able to fulfill what's what's expected of me? If you expect me to work out of your branch or out of your office Monday through Friday from nine to five, right. but I only value this opportunity as three to four transactions a month, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to close seven or eight, that's not realistic. Right. You know, if, if, if you're asking me to pay $10,000 a month, but when I look at how many buyers do you all represent and close on a monthly basis, and when I take 25% of that number understanding, because I listened to a podcast like this one, or, <laughs> or I some, did some research by listening to a, to a show like this, I've learned that a 25% capture rate is how I should be running my numbers. Mm -hmm. You have to figure out in basis points and in dollars, does it make sense? Right. Is there enough potential business that I'm willing to pay that fee? 
in order to see an ROI. Yeah. Like you, you, you have to know that. You have to run that. If, if by entering into this relationship, am I going to, to turn off the ability to, to go obtain business elsewhere? Yeah. Am I going to pigeonhole myself? Am I going to put all my eggs in one basket? Mm-hmm. Like these are all things that need to be considered. And there's a time and place for everything. It may be great for you to enter into an MSA early on in your career yeah. because it's a great way to give yourself a boost. Mm-hmm. But at some point, you may want to take the training wheels off. You may want to exit that relationship mm-hmm. so that you can level up one more time. Yeah. I think that's what's key to know yeah. is that there's never a wrong or right. There's always a right time and a right place. Mm-hmm. And you have to determine, is this the right time and the right place? And there's always, you need to find a way to yes. Like, how, how would this make sense? Mm-hmm. Maybe the way it's being presented to you doesn't make sense, but do you have the fortitude and the ability to sit down, run your own numbers and say, here's how it would make sense. Is the person on the other side of this equation willing to accept my terms? Mm. If the answer is no, then you politely decline the opportunity. You move on with, with the rest of your, your business, rest of your life, keeping in mind that just because someone else is willing to be a sucker doesn't mean you too need to be a sucker. If someone else is willing to enter into a relationship with money and that money is one that you've already determined does not offer you a very good chance to achieve an ROI, let that person do it because they're only going to capture 25% of the business. That still means you can build relationships with agents within that office and try to capture your fair share. MSAs, JVs, and desk rentals according to Dio. If you guys have further questions on this particular topic, feel free to reach out to me. LinkedIn is probably a really easy way. Just uh, connect with me if we're not already connected on LinkedIn. Uh, I'll do my best to answer your questions. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's all we have for today's show. He's John Coleman. I'm Dustin Owen. You've tuned into the Loan Officer Podcast. Please continue to tune in, like us, share us. If you're listening for the first time, follow. And um, we'll catch you on the flip side. Peace. Peace.